can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and, you know, some of the ups and downs of the journey. You know, Greg, I love talking about the, <clears throat> the challenges. I remember talking when I had Tony Horton on a P90X. Yeah, he sold millions of dollars of P90X, but he got his start as a street mime. He made his food and rent money by putting a hat on the street and doing street performing as a street mime, which was shocking to me, but I shouldn't have been shocked. Um, <clears throat> Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, talks about how Steve Jobs offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. So check those episodes out, many more on inspiredinsider.com. This episode is brought to you by Rise25. I co-founded my business partner, John Corcoran. We help B2B companies give to and connect to their Dream 100 partnerships and clients by helping you run your podcast. Um, and you know, Greg, for me, the number one thing in life and business is relationships. I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships and a podcast is a way I can have companies I love. I believe in friends, um, you know, people share their story with the audience and give to them. So, um, it's been one of the best things I've done for my life and my business just to give to the people in my universe. So check out rise25.com. If you have thought about or want to start a podcast, or you could just email us with questions, rise25.com. Um, you know, I want to introduce today's guest, and I want a big thank you to Dean Dutro and Ryan O'Connor, uh, who run Worth E-Commerce, because they're like, you got to have branch furniture, you have to have Greg Hayes on to tell their story. <clears throat> so thank you to both of you. They are email experts, if you don't know what they do. They basically, I, I say it like this, Greg, I'm like, they kind of are like an ATM for your email. So they send out emails, money comes back. Um, and they're telling me one story of a, I think of all things, it was a uh, cake delivery company or something. And they helped increase from 100,000 a month to 300,000 a month in revenue. 50% came from email. So I was like, okay, if you could do it for a cake company, you could probably do it for just about anyone. So check out, and they have a podcast too, Relationship uh, Commerce. And uh, today I have Greg Hayes. He's founder and CEO of Branch Furniture. And as Dean uh, describes it, they're a badass office furniture company who has supplied companies like Google and Shopify with thousands of desks and ergonomic chairs. They're featured in many publications as the most comfortable office chair. They serve both large and small companies and even direct to consumer. So if you need to furnish your home office, you know, check out their website. And um, I was checking it out the past few days. They have some amazing uh, selection there. And um, it's just an easy way to furnish your office furniture. So Greg, thanks for joining me. Yeah, Jeremy, thank you for having me. You know, I want to dig in. There's a couple of things I want to talk about at some point, what happened in Sweden. Okay. But um, before we get to that, um, I thought you'd be, you'd be a perfect person to talk about the future of work. Because here's the thing, you're on the front lines, whatever people are saying, it doesn't matter. People vote with their pocketbooks, right? Yes. And when you see what people are buying and what they're doing and their behavior, that's really what is happening out in the world. So I love to have you talk about what you're seeing as buying trends and the future of work as we see it as the new normal. Yeah, okay. So, so I'll just get it out there right away. Uh, there has been a lot of commentary about the end of the office and everyone's gonna work from home permanently from here on out. Uh, that is not what we're seeing, um, but work from home is going to be a big component of working going forward. Like that, that's just a fact now we know that. Um, and so in terms of, of what we're seeing uh, with all of these white collar workers suddenly uh, operating out of their living rooms or from their, their dining room tables, the, the first thing that we're seeing is everybody needs an ergonomic chair. Um, and, and so we've seen that part of our business explode uh, actually to the point from kind of, May onward, where we couldn't even keep up with the demand that was coming in. So that's been great. And then the second thing that that's that a good problem people, to have. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, good, I've it's, heard people, you know, from my conversations, I may ask, where you work? I'm working at the kitchen table on the couch. My back is killing me. 
I have a background as a chiropractor, so I totally relate to them on many levels. Yeah. So, but people are just making do and they're needing to find different solutions because it's just not working what's at home. Totally. And, and like where we are here in, in New York, my wife and I live in a small apartment in, in Manhattan and, and like we've kind of been victims of um, not having room for additional furniture. And so we've got one branch ergonomic chair in our apartment. And, and so my wife typically takes that and I'm typically the one on the couch or working from bed. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I literally feel the pain. Um, and then really the other thing that we're seeing, we're starting to see more and more of is people start to realize that they're not, they're probably not going back to the office in the traditional sense for the next at least six months, maybe even year. Um, but we're starting to see a lot of sales of desks, uh, specifically standing desks. And, and again, this is not just us. This is a macro trend. Um, it's kind of a, a tailwind in the office furniture industry for those who can kind of figure out how to get it to people's homes and apartments. Um, and so what it's done is it's probably at least doubled the size of, of the market for work from home furniture, which was still, you know, a three or $4 billion a year market going into this. But now that's probably closer to a $10 billion a year uh, wow. market. So it's been an interesting shift. Um, but yeah, to, to your question about the future of work, uh, I, I'm sure you've read the commentary that's out there about the end of the office building and starting to convert all of these office towers to um, to residential buildings. And, and we're, we're just not really seeing that. Um, two things are happening. One, there hasn't necessarily been the flight from cities that I think most people expected. I certainly expected. Some cities have been hit harder than others. San Francisco and, and, and New York City have, have probably seen a little bit more of a flight. But you look at cities like Dallas and, and Atlanta uh, and Houston, and you've actually got um, an increasing population in the cities uh, throughout COVID. So we don't think that there's going to be this exodus to the suburbs. Um, and then the other thing that we're seeing is leases are starting to be signed again for office space. And, and we're starting to see companies purchase furniture for six, 12 months out from now. Um, they're making those decisions now, knowing that they're going to be back in the office. So um, we are going to end up in a world where companies realize that people can work from home and be productive. And they're going to allow them to do that a few days a week, maybe, or a week on a week off. And otherwise there'll be a home base at the office. So you're seeing, you know, when people are saying it's the end of the office type of thing, you're still seeing the trend of people buying, um, building out, um, or, you know, starting to plan for going back. Yeah. And it's really interesting. Um, we, there were a number of companies that we were working with going into this who, who obviously put their leases on hold and now they're getting back to it and they're starting to renegotiate or starting to negotiate these leases again. And, and so part of what we do is we do the planning of the office space for companies before they purchase the furniture. And we had expected these companies to come back and say, okay, change of plans. We're going to really spread things out. Um, but the approach that they're taking is look, the world is going to go back to normal at some point. We're signing a five or a 10 year lease. We're not going to outfit the office in a way that works for the next year and then have an office that doesn't work well for us for the, you know, the next four or nine years. And so these companies are, from what we're seeing, still planning to build out offices just like they had been before. And so they'll have a they'll have a different work schedule. They'll have an alternating day or alternating week work schedule until there's a vaccine in place. But um, ultimately, they seem to be planning to go back to kind of business as usual in the office, which is really interesting. Does it seem to be almost better for you in that sense? Because all these people have to outfit their homes because they're going to have to you know, work out of their homes, even if they go back to the office. Yeah, it's been, uh, it, it's weird to get a boon uh, to your business from a pandemic, but we've certainly had a boon to our business. We, and we can talk about this a little bit, but we didn't even have a consumer facing business before April. Um, we were strictly focused on, on enterprise businesses. Um, and now we've got two markets to sell into. And beyond that, now the average office worker who needs one ergonomic chair or one desk uh, historically, now they need two. And so in a weird way, the size of the market for what we do has almost doubled overnight. Yeah. I could see it even tripling because for me, like if someone has an office and they have a home and they realize I don't want to work from home because they can't get anything done, especially if you have kids, they're running in. So I have a separate office that I got closer to my home outside of the other office. So I have to outfit this office and my home, which I'll be working more out of. So I could see it actually, there have three workspaces. 
I don't know yeah, if you've seen that. We haven't seen that yet, but um, there is a lot of talk in the commercial real estate industry right now about satellite, suburban satellite offices. And so you may see in places like, you know, using New York City as an example, in places like Connecticut and New Jersey and Long Island, um, where you historically have pretty high vacancy rates in the commercial buildings there, you may see those vacancy rates really drop and and these companies that are headquartered in Manhattan take little satellite offices. And so, yeah, you, you... you potentially end up in a world where there are three desks and three chairs for every one employee, which, which is wild. How is the shift to direct to consumer? Is it a natural shift where they find out from you about you from their company? Like, okay, well, we're, you could, this is the company we're dealing with or how are you getting in, in front of the consumer? Yeah. So I would say that there was one enormous shift and then a number of very small iterative shifts that followed it as we kind of learned what we were supposed to be doing. Um, to be clear, we were we had never intended on being a direct consumer business. We were strictly focused on enterprise business. If anything, we did not want to deal with consumers when with our, <laughs> our traditional business, we would have right. a, a, an order come in from a consumer it's 1% of the value of a typical order that we were dealing with and it takes almost as much effort. And so, um, and then, you know, the pandemic hits and in our enterprise facing traditional business pretty much goes away. And so we had to shift. Um, and for us, that meant completely changing the way that we did everything, changing the way that our warehouse operates and how the, those employees were trained, changing the way that we ship things, changing the way that we handle things like white glove delivery, um, changing the way, the way that we market. And so, Marketing was really, it went from a very hands-on approach where um, our salespeople were in touch directly with businesses um, or were developing relationships with architects and with landlords and with commercial real estate brokers to a world where it was all about, um, you know, PR uh, and advertising on Facebook and Google and finding um, affiliate opportunities things that we, we had spent almost no time or energy on going into this suddenly became very important to our business. So we had to learn very quickly and that's where a million little shifts came in. Um, and so from the time that we started that process in April until now in August, we actually look like a completely different company. Um, if you would have popped your head in to our office in April and if, then if you sat in on a Zoom meeting today, um, you wouldn't even know that you were dealing dealing with the same company. And, and so we've learned a lot. We've seen a lot of progress. Um, and it's been just from like a, a business case study experience. Uh, it's been a really, really interesting ride for the last six months. Yeah, I could see how the workflow would totally change. You get a call from Google, we need hundreds of desks. It's just way more efficient. Okay, boom, send it to one location. Then you have someone in, you know, wherever, New Jersey, like I need this one chair. Yeah, totally different workflow. And, and we had to learn things about consumers. Like we, our business, a part of what we, we, we did um, for enterprises to make things easy was, you know, there's, there's one price and it includes everything. And that includes delivery and assembly and cleanup of, of everything. And so, you know, we're entering this direct consumer world and we're thinking, well, is, is that what we need to provide to consumers too? Is that what they expect? And very quickly you learn that they don't really care. They'll take the 10, 15 minutes to put an ergonomic chair together because for a consumer, I mean, they're used to spending two hours trying to put a dresser together from Ikea. So 10 minutes to put the chair together isn't a big deal to them. And we kind of learned these things as we went. Some things we learned very quickly, some things took a while to learn. But um, yeah, it's, it's been a very interesting experience. Did you find from the, you know, the chair to the desk, um, how did you manage that? Does the desk still, okay, it's, you assemble it because it's a very white glove for you, you can send one person to assemble a bunch of desks. How does it work for the consumer for the desk perspective? Yeah, it's, it's even more. So that is one where there have been a number of iterations. Um, a big problem that we faced early on in the transition was that all of our products were packaged to be shipped in bulk on pallets, um, arrive at an office and then be assembled by professionals. They weren't packaged to be dropped in the mail with UPS and go through their entire supply chain and then uh, end up at a customer's house for them to put together. And so we had to repackage everything. That was quite easy for chairs. It was very difficult for desks. And so it was a, it was a process of a few months to get our desks in a position where they could do that. Um, and we also had to make changes to the way that we actually manufacture the desks um, because there are elements of a desk that require a professional to put together. And so we started having our factory pre-assemble parts of the desk that might be difficult for a consumer to do themselves. 
And so we've just very recently got into a position where um, we can now ship out desks. Um, they can arrive through UPS at a consumer's home and in five to 10 minutes, the consumer has a desk up and running and ready to work at. Yeah. And we'll talk about kind of your background, how you came to this with commercial real estate and, and breather too. But I mean, I remember, you know, it's just the pain of actually buying furniture. You know, when I w went to, to get desks for this office, I did so much research and part of it was, I don't want to assemble something. So is it easy to assemble? And I would have to find someone to hire to assemble it because I would probably put my computer on it and would collapse or something like that. Like just, I would, I'm not the person to assemble something. So I can imagine, there's just a lot of, you know, hard, a lot of research that goes into it. So you provide, just talk about some of the stuff that you provide. If someone goes, you know, they can go to branchfurniture.com and see, yep. but you know, this is stuff you, you sought out many manufacturing options is not like, okay, this has like been a painstaking process in general to find the right, right thing. And it's probably a process to say, figure out which products do we want to actually produce. Yeah. Um, and look, I, I guess backing up to even finding the factories in the first place, a lot of, a lot of, there's a lot of luck involved in the process. So there's, there's hard work and there's luck. And then in a weird way, um, naivete played to our advantage because um, me and my two co-founders, uh, none of the three of us had any background in office furniture. We were coming in completely uninitiated. We had no kind of preconceptions about the, the right way to do this. And so we just came in from, from um, the perspective of like, if we were starting an office furniture company right now, or, or if we were a consumer ordering office furniture right now, what would be the biggest annoyances for us to deal with? We talked to a lot of people about that, a lot of office managers and, and people that bought furniture. We took all of those things and then we constructed a process ourselves that would fix those things. Um, and so when you look at our process from, from, an, an enterprise, from the enterprise side of things, not from the direct to consumer side of things, what we wanted to do was provide very high quality um, furniture that is high design. And so the, the way to do that is to find really good manufacturing partners, which took a while, but we were able to do. Um, and then to make the process from choosing your furniture to having your furniture installed and ready to work at completely seamless and, and totally affordable. And so that involves a few things that involves one being able to do it very quickly. Um, and so we do that by limiting our SKUs, having all of our SKUs on hand um, uh, stationed in North America. So we have warehouses in, in the United States and in Canada, um, and and, uh, and and the ability to ship those out and have those installed in kind of like ten days. Um, the second thing is to make sure that uh, it's a very easy process for designing an office. Historically, you would go out and you get an office designer and you pay a whole bunch of money and you might get an architect. And we've just said like, look, here's the price. The price involves your office design. We will take care of that for you. Then it in, in, in includes the delivery. It involves the assembly, it involves the removal of, of um, all of the, the debris afterwards and pretty much everything you need to get it from I need office furniture to people are up and running uh, at our, our desks and chairs. And so just getting to the last part of your, your question, how do we figure out what it was that we actually needed? Um, we started with just the basics. So in, in early 2019, when we launched the business, it was a very limited lineup. Um, we had an ergonomic chair we had a standard desk a sit stand desk um and and a filing cabinet and that was it and so that was almost like a, a test can we can we brand a business um that sells very high quality furniture and can we get companies to trust us to uh install that furniture and can we install it, it correctly and and so there was a lot of learning involved um, we did it well and then we very very quickly learned what else they cared about and so with every new customer, every new business that um, we brought on board, um, we learned that, you know, they needed conference chairs and conference tables and bistro tables and, you know, uh, stacking chairs. And, and over time, um, we designed new furniture and brought on new manufacturing partners and eventually have reached this point now where we are able to outfit entire offices for large companies. And, you know, we're, we're doing up to kind of 150, 200,000 square feet at a time, um, hmm. which a year ago, uh, would have seemed like a pipe dream. Yeah. So if you go on, someone goes on branchfurniture.com, you could see the work from home area, the office chair area, the desk area, the storage area, conference area, lounge area, 
and panels also. So there's different um, categories. And a year ago, that would have been a desk, a chair. You're like, here's your desk. desk. <laughs> yeah, here's your it, chair. It, was, it was very, yeah. very But limited. that's, yeah, I mean, you, you have to start somewhere, you know, and what people are probably in the most need of. Um, so you looked all over the place for manufacturing, all right? Yes. You yeah. show up in China. Mm -hmm. What happens? So, well, a couple of things happened. First of all, we looked everywhere. We, we initially wanted to manufacture in North America. So we looked in Canada. We looked in the United States. Um, it just wasn't going to happen. Uh, it, the, the prices that we were targeting to sell the businesses were lower than the prices that would have cost us to manufacture here at the scale that we were at then. Now we, we do uh, manufacturing in California. We're working on some in Canada as well. But initially, um, so we, we kind of looked at the whole world and, and ultimately like China, I heard this line somewhere, China is the world's 3D printer. Um, they, they just had the entire supply chain and I forget the number now, but it was something like, you know, 89% of the furniture on earth comes out of this one area in China. And so um, I flew out there. Uh, I had hired a translator. Um, we had almost no money to work with. So we did this kind of on the cheap. And it was like, I, I had found a bunch of factories um, that I wanted to go visit. The translator took me around all these factories. They were all terrible. And so ultimately, we, we went to this trade show. They while were I terrible. Was there. They were terrible. And while we we're at this trade show, um, the translator mentioned, she had forgot to tell me this previously, but she mentioned that one time um, a government representative from a Middle Eastern country had hired her to be, uh, uh, to be a translator and because he needed to outfit um, an entire government ministry building with very high-end furniture. And so she knew about this factory and she could take me there. And so like, okay, let's, let's go see this factory. And I walked in and it was just like immediately, okay, this is it. This is incredibly high quality. This is American quality manufacturing. Um, and so we just kind of pretended, I just kind of pretended that we were bigger than we were and uh, hammered out a contract with them to get them to start building our designs. And, and then uh, kind of a couple of months after that, we were in market in New York, uh, knocking on doors, selling furniture. But it was a, a wild process that when I mentioned earlier that luck is involved, that's one of those moments where like yeah. if, if my translator doesn't mention that she had been to this factory one time five years ago. If you have a different um, translator. If I have a different translator, then um, we don't make the connection with this incredible factory that's yeah. allowing us to produce really high-end furniture. Yeah. So we'll, I want to go back to Sweden in a second, but go, keep going in this journey. So you now have to sell. You just signed this contract. Yeah. And what do you do first? Oh, so... It was a mess. We, we had no idea what we were doing. Uh, so, so the first thing we did was we negotiated for uh, a showroom in Manhattan uh, near, near Madison Square Park, um, which we couldn't afford, but we were like, oh, how are we going to sell, you know, furniture? I'm sorry, I've got a... We know we're in New York City. We'll yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, it was like, well, how are we going to sell furniture? You know, an average furniture deal is going to be could be a hundred thousand dollars. We didn't even know it's like buying a car. You're not going to buy a car without going to a showroom. We need a showroom. And so we, you know, we take the showroom, we have some samples of our furniture flown in and we just start reaching out to people like cold, reaching out to people, reaching out to real estate brokers, reaching out to businesses that are growing on LinkedIn. And of course everyone ignores us, but, um, luckily a couple of businesses, uh, they come in and they see the furniture and they had been to, competitor showrooms in the area and had seen comparable quality furniture that was priced at two to three times the price that ours were was and they were willing to take a risk on us and so uh then suddenly we had a new problem on our hand which was we had no idea how to actually execute on the operational side of the business and so suddenly we're learning about um you know having to deal with unions uh, to install furniture in a building and booking freight elevators uh and and the big thing that we, we didn't know about was how slow things can be getting from our factories to our warehouse. Uh, and so, you know, we ended up in some situations where we had companies telling us, companies who we had already signed contracts with, telling us that they needed the furniture in three weeks, but the furniture wasn't going to be in our warehouse for five weeks. Um, and, and frankly, we got really lucky and we had some construction delays kind of go our way and everything ended up going smoothly. Uh, customers had a good experience and then they started telling their friends about us and 
things start to grow organically. But uh, it was, I will say in the early days, uh, when we didn't know how to sell and we didn't know how to execute on operations, it was touch and go. Um, but you know, there, there, again, there's some luck that plays into it. There's a lot of nuances there. When you yeah. say freight elevator booking and, and union, I'd be like, okay, I give up. It's just too much. Like, so all the little, little things you don't think about. Yeah. Or even things like, um, you know, you're, you've got a, a delivery scheduled to a building uh, and then the freight partner that you're working with for the last mile delivery informs you that, oh, actually we're not open on Mondays and mm. everything is scheduled. Everything else is scheduled for the Monday. And, you know, you get into this negotiation, you need to open for this Monday. And so just things that, uh, you know, you build a business plan and you build a, a financial model and everything looks like, you know, why is nobody doing this? This is such an enormous opportunity to, you know, we're going to print all of this money and then you get into it and it's like, oh, it's really, really hard to run a business. Um, but you learn that quickly. We'll talk about starting it and how did you have the capital and everything like that. But um, what happened in Sweden? Yeah. So that's funny. Uh, I'm trying to think of where you might've heard that or read that. Uh, so I'll back up even a little bit. I just bit. talked to your wife. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so, so I'll back up even a little bit before that. I had uh, always wanted to start a business. I knew, I always knew that I would start a business. And so my career had been pretty institutional for the first five years. I was at a, a big fund. And then um, my older brother, who is a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, gave me the advice, uh, knowing that I wanted to start a business, that I, sh I should go work for a startup and learn what that's like. So I went to work for a startup um, here in New York called Breather. Um, and, and so my wife at the time, fiance, girlfriend, and then fiance was, was aware that I had these entrepreneurial aspirations. Um, and so in the summer of, uh, or sorry, in, in late 2017, we got engaged. And then in the summer of 2018, when I was really getting going with this idea, privately, uh, we were on vacation in Sweden. We were planning a wedding. Uh, we had no money. And I broke it to my fiance that I thought that it was time to quit my job. Um, and start this business in the furniture industry, which I had no background in at that time, had no co-founder for. And uh, to her credit, she immediately said, look, like I, you've always wanted to start a business. Um, I know the timing is not great, uh, but if you've got the idea uh, and if you think it's solid, like I, I, we'll make it work. I'll cover, you know, I'll, we'll, we'll do what it takes to cover our lifestyle. Um, and so she gave me the thumbs up. And uh, I, we got back from that trip and I went in and left my job and a month later was getting started on this. So yeah, I, I mean, I have to give her all the credit in the world. She's been incredibly supportive. Talk about, you know, what you were seeing at Breather because it didn't, the, the idea didn't come out of completely left field. Totally. So, so there were kind of two inspirations for this. The first was that um, before I went to Breather, I had actually been interviewing um, at this private equity fund in New York where the, the, um, the partners in the fund had launched the fund and started fundraising at the beginning of the 2008-2009 recession. And so they couldn't fundraise. Um, one of them had a background in architecture and they started um, a furniture company. And they actually ended up building that uh, into a fairly sizable furniture company that they then just owned and ran on the side. And it's a multi-million dollar business for them. Um, and so that kind of was the first time where a light bulb went off and I was like, wow, there's a lot of money in furniture. I never really, you know, think about it. Um, and, but then the second thing was that, so I went to work at Breather, um, and, and so I was in the real estate group there, um, and Breather was, was fairly large. By the time I left, Breather was 250 employees. It was really growing incredibly quickly. Um, and so we were, by the, from the time I started there till the time I left, we went from 200 Breather spaces to 500 Breather spaces. You can imagine how much furniture was was being procured for that. And so there was an entire design and procurement team. Um, and it was just like interesting to see, you know, they wanted to work with Herman Miller and they wanted to work with Knoll and Steelcase and, and Kimball and these really incredible brands. Um, but the price point just didn't make sense. Like you, you couldn't underwrite the spaces if you were paying full price for, for this furniture. And so they were buying furniture from sometimes Ikea, furniture off of Amazon, Wayfair, and, and ultimately started producing their own furniture overseas. And I just could not believe how difficult it was to get 
high quality office furniture at an affordable price. And then the other thing that I, I hadn't understood before was that it takes two, three, four months from the time that you place a furniture order with these big brands until the time that it actually has arrived and installed in your space. Um, and so to me, I was like, you know, this is probably like a, whatever, a five, $10 billion a year industry. And then I, I, you know, did some research and it was a 40, $45 billion a year industry in the United States. And it was just like, this is, there's too much opportunity here not to go after. Um, and so, yeah, Breather was a real inspiration just seeing these really talented people um, who had all of these connections in the procurement world were still unable to, to find a good solution for furniture. Yeah. And so, and you were also in commercial real estate that also, you know, plays a role too, right? Yeah. Well, that one's interesting because, the, so I had spent the first five years of my career in traditional fund commercial real estate. And that was just more of an interest thing where the portfolio that I was managing was, it was quite a high end portfolio. And so you had a lot of um, hedge funds and banks and, and, you know, law firms, companies like that moving into the portfolio and you'd have conversations with these companies and you'd find out that they were paying, you know, they're paying 70 or $80 a square foot for, for their real estate. And then they're paying this additional, you know, 50 to $60 a square foot up front uh, just for their office furniture. And, and I just could not believe that they were paying that much money just for the stuff that people were sitting in. And, and even I found out uh, toward the end of my time at the fund that the chair that I had been sitting in every day, which I'd never thought twice about was nearly a $2,000 chair. Um, you know, it's like a, it's like a, a used Hyundai and, and I didn't think twice about it. And so that was very much like, wow, office office furniture is a completely different beast than residential furniture. Residential furniture, I can go to Ikea or I can go on Amazon and, and I can get something decent that's going to last for a while. Office furniture, if I want something good, I'm paying thousands and thousands of dollars for that thing. And so that was the first, very first little inkling that mm -hmm. there might be something there. But um, I wouldn't say that, that an idea took hold then. Yeah. So you and your wife, Greg, have this conversation or at the time fiance, um, and funding wise, do you go to your brother and go, Hey brother, I need, cause I mean, you were talking about real physical goods that, yeah. you know, you need to produce. This isn't, I mean, although if you're producing a software, you still need talent and, and work, but these are, you know, this is physical stuff. Yeah. So, uh, no, I did not go to my brother. Uh, <laughs> my brother has been an incredible, um, uh, intellectual support, emotional support. Uh, he, he just kind of always knows what to do, but I did not want to be the guy who went and asked his successful brother for money to start his thing. So no, didn't do that. Um, so me and, and my co-founders, uh, we, we started kind of knocking on the doors of the who's who of New York city pre early stage angel investors. And uh, as you know, you, you hear the story from, from, kind of everyone who's at that stage, it's very rare that you have an idea that people are just like, that's a $10 million idea. I'm going to write you a check at a great valuation. Um, but so, so, you know, we probably talked with a couple of dozen people and everyone kind of been hot. No one wants to be the first check. Everyone wants to hear that someone else is in. And then ultimately we ended up on the phone with um, a, a guy here in New York city named Ed Lando, who was a, a fairly prolific, um, very early stage investor. And, we, we pitched him over the phone. We gave him a terrible pitch. I remember <laughs> looking at one of my co-founders, Sib, afterwards and just saying like, wow, dude, that was bad. What and, was bad uh, about it? Ah, we just, it was just one of those days. You just, the words weren't flowing. Mm. We, we weren't properly articulating the value proposition. Um, but he saw through that, I guess. He got it. And he emailed us the next day and he said, look, I think, I think you've got something here. Um, and even if you don't have something here, I think that um, the two of you uh, that, that he had talked to um, can can figure something else out. So I'm in. This is kind of the value that I'm in at. Um, take it or leave it. And we took it. And then once we had that, once we had him on board, uh, life got a lot easier. So, um, you know, we, we had a little bit of friends and family money, but we started to see other people, other angel investors in New York, particularly those with a real estate background who understood the problem saying, okay, this is interesting. There's a big opportunity here. This is a big market. Um, yeah, we're in, and it was kind of, you know, 
25,000 to $50,000 at a time. We even took a $5,000 check from someone who we thought could, could be valuable um, in other ways other than, than the money. Um, and so, yeah, you, we just kind of like built it up over the course of a few months. We ultimately raised $300,000 from angel investors and that was what got us off the ground. Um, and with that money, we were able to prove that the product was a great product, um, that we could sell it, um, that we could deliver and install it, that our customers were really, really happy. And then we took that, you know, call it a three or four month case study. Um, and we went out to the actual venture, kind of more tr traditional venture market for, for a seed round. Uh, and pretty quickly raised just over $2 million yeah. um, from, from some traditional VCs. Yeah. yeah, because anyone who's in e-commerce knows, well, the more successful you get, it means you need to buy more inventory. So you always it's, need capital, even if you're growing a lot, even more it, so, right? It's true. It's true. We have been, um, so, you know, I, I don't know if you've read Shoe Dog, but this, this is the One classic. of my favorite books. I love yeah. that, that book. It's, uh, it's entrepreneurial therapy. I think. It is. It is. Yeah. And it was kind of Phil Knight's big issue. Um, he kept running into, he couldn't buy more inventory because he was growing too quickly and the bank didn't trust him. Um, and so I had read that book um, and, and me and Sid and Verity, my two co-founders, uh, we, the three of us all have the exact same attitude to building a business, which is we're not going to be those founders who go out and we raise a stupid amount of money just because we can. Um, we want to be the founders who raise a responsible amount of money and we build this business efficiently. And so we have probably sacrificed a little bit of pace of growth. I mean, we've still had a very healthy pace of growth, but we probably sacrificed a little bit of that. Um, and we've, we've been very focused on, on early profitability, on running the business efficiently, on not over hiring, stretching uh, ourselves and, and, and our team until we really need to add another person. And so just like adding all of those things up, we've, we've left ourselves in a position where we've always had money to fund our, our inventory requirements. And also like we're, we're operating in an industry that has enormous margins. And so we're saving our clients a lot of money by, by cutting into those margins, but there's still a healthy margin left for us at the end of the day to reinvest back into the business. And so um, again, like, you know, you, all of these things that you don't know going into it, but sometimes play in your favor and sometimes don't. Um, the nature of the furniture industry has played into our favor a little bit in that sense, as much as it's expensive to, to build our inventory. Um, you know, as long as we can continue to sell it at the pace that we are, we're, we're likely in pretty good shape. Greg, when was a point where you were especially, not we've made it, but we've got one of those customers that you're like, wow, now we're, we're at a point like we're attracting these caliber of, of clients. And that, not yet. Uh, I, I never, I, I never feel comfortable. Um, and so there is, there, there was one um, earlier this year where it was the first time we had the first time we had kind of like a, approaching a, a million dollar single transaction. Um, and, and so with that deal, uh, there was a sense in the company of like, okay, this is, this was the hump that we needed to get over in, in order to attract more companies like this. Um, but I, I've never felt that way. Like even when we did that deal, it was like, okay, that's done. Now what's next? And so I, I don't think it's possible for me to say yeah. that, um, you know, we've, we've, we've had that yet. I don't know if I'll ever think that we, we get there. I figured maybe like, oh, even if Google bought one office chair, it's like just someone from Google <laughs> um, well, the, the getting cool in the door. Thing, yeah. The cool thing with Google has been with the work from home stuff um, where we, we actually found out that um, some Google employees, when, when Google announced their, their policy, they, had a list internally of companies that Google that were Google verified that their um, their employees should buy from or could could buy from um, safely, and a number of Google employees had actually uh, suggested that we be on that list, mm. and so we were reached out to by Google's internal I don't know if it was their procurement team, and they said, look, we we've, we've been hearing about you, um, kind of give us your pitch, and we we'd love to add you to the list, and so we exchanged a few emails with them and next thing we knew um they were 
for emailing Google employees about buying furniture from us on Google's dime. So that was pretty great. Um, it was, it was just like a, a real vote of confidence for us. Yeah, totally. How did you meet your co-founders? That is a great question. Uh, so, so Sib, I met through, um, so there's kind of a funny thing that happened. Um, I had an original co-founder in the business, a guy named Ashe. He had been my intern when I was at Breather, incredibly talented guy. He's actually a VC now, um, but he was still in school. He was at Harvard. And so we were working on this business and he just like couldn't, he was focused on school and he just like couldn't do it. And so he actually said to me like, look, I, I need to be focused on my academics. I can't put the time that's required into this right now. Um, but I know a guy who I think would be a perfect replacement for me. You should talk to Sib. And so he introduced me to Sib. Sib and I went out for a beer and then we went up for another beer and we got to know each other. I think that's like the best way to, you know, go out and talk to someone and just like in a casual setting, learn what they're like. And we were just like, like super aligned on the way that we thought about culture and building business. And, um, and he's an incredibly smart guy. And so, so Sib was first, and then very quickly after that, um, so my wife's, one of her best friends was doing her MBA at Columbia, and my wife had been over at her place telling her about this business that I was being stupid and quitting my job to start. And um, the friend's roommate, uh, I'm, I'm Canadian, the friend's roommate is, is actually also Canadian, also from Toronto, um, and she was kind of interested in listening in on the conversation. She was just finishing up her MBA at Columbia and, uh, she ended up reaching out to me and she, she said, look, like I've, I've been working for these big finance departments, uh, my whole life, the rest of my life looks like I'm going to be kind of in a suit every day. I don't want to do that. Um, can I, can I come work with you for a few weeks just to see what it's like to work at a startup? And she literally just wanted to like for free for a few weeks, see what it was like to work at a and I'm talking about like a week old startup. And so she did. And after like two weeks, Sib and I just looked at each other and we were like, I, she's so good. We, we need her to be part of this team. And so um, we had the conversation with her and she ended up deciding that she was going to sacrifice the crazy job offers that she was getting from the biggest the big private equity firms in, in New York city and come join us and take no salary. And so, so yeah, it, it was, uh, I, again, luck, luck is a crazy part of this story, but uh, very lucky to meet both Sib and, and Verity. You said, you know, Greg, she's so good. What did you see in that short period of time? Um, it's, so, it's so hard to remember exactly what it was now because what she has done for us since is build out our entire operations, the, the operations side of business. Like she has built that from scratch. But at the time we actually, she actually wasn't doing that. She was actually working on on finance and industry research and some of these kind of like more traditional eye banking type skills um, and was just bringing in like really impressive, um, like really impressive material, everything that she did. It seemed like everything that she did, the output of it was super high quality. Um, and so it was just like, and, and she was just like, you know, like Sid, she was just a natural leader and it just felt like the three of us worked well together. So yeah, um, yeah it felt natural. Greg, first of all, thank you. I have, I have two last questions. I want to yeah. encourage people to go to branchfurniture.com, check out what they have um, there. They have some really, you know, not only, you know, it's nice looking, but very affordable, as Greg said. Um, Greg, so two last questions. One, um, I always like to ask some of the challenge points, some of the low points, um, one that sticks out. And then the flip side, outside of obviously that, that, big deal that you got at the time that you were proud of a proud moment. Um, what's been a challenge point, low point. So the ultimate low point for me was Thanksgiving of 2018. Uh, we had raised basically no money. We had committed to this shipment coming in of, of our first run of inventory from a factory. Um, we had just signed our first customer, uh, who, which was a fairly substantial at the time seemed like a fairly substantial deal. And over Thanksgiving weekend, um, we found out that there was going to be a delay on production 
of of our our um, of our inventory run. And so I was coming out of that weekend was going to have to tell our only customer that we we couldn't service them anymore. Um, I thought that I knew what stress was <laughs> from my career. You don't, you don't know what stress is until you're in a situation where you've left your job and you're a month and a half into starting a company and you're already about to fail. Uh, and, and, and never mind that, convince two other people that they should not move forward with their careers to join you in something that is now going to be a failure. Uh, and so I had an actual physical manifestation of that stress. I, 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 I couldn't move my neck for about a week. I was, you know, I couldn't even drive. I was stuck like this. Um, so that was to me the low point. Um, and look, there have been stressful moments since, but you kind of learn to compartmentalize them and deal with them. And, and, uh, and, and frankly, you just have to take an attitude of, of I'm going to figure this out. There's no option, but to fix this and figure this out. And, th and that's actually what we ended up doing with that situation. Um, we were able to find another uh, shipping company who could, get it from the factory earlier. Um, we shifted to the West coast instead of into the port of New York, shifted to LA, put it on a train from LA to New Jersey. Um, and we got it there in time. Uh, so, you know, you just kind of figure these things out and then, sorry, what was the second part of the question? Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's amazing. Um, I remember I had one of the founders of yes to yes to carrots. And I think they got a, like, a a order from Walgreens or something and they couldn't ship it. So they paid to put it on a plane or something that they, they lost money on it, but they just figured out a way to get it to oh, them. You know, you do all sorts of crazy stuff. One of, uh, another one of our first customers was in Chicago. And um, so we had hired a, we didn't have our logistics figured out yet. We had hired a local company in Chicago to, to install the stuff. And uh, I was actually, on a trip fundraising and I was about to walk into a VC's office and my phone rings and it's this assembly guy and he's like, can't figure out how to put all this furniture. We can't figure out how to put all this furniture together for this company. And so I, he, I'm like FaceTime me and he FaceTimes me and I see that the warehouse had sent them all of the wrong stuff. And so I walked into the meeting, pitched the VC, went straight to the airport, hopped on a flight to New York, rented a car, went to our warehouse, packed up all of the right stuff that we needed into a series of hockey bags and things like that, drove to the airport, bought a ticket uh, and, a, and, a, and the ability to, to travel with freight to Chicago and didn't sleep, arrived at 6 a.m. at the building and was in there assembling the stuff myself. Wow. And then, of course, the CEO of the company walks in and he's like, who are you? And I kind of explained the situation to him. And uh, he was like, do you happen to be raising money right now? And I was like, yeah, actually we are. And he was like, I will write you a check right now. Wow. If, if you are willing to take this, if you're willing to do this to make it right, like this is the type of company that I want to be a part of. So, you know, you just, it, there are a million stories like that from the early days that we don't knock on wood. We don't um, experience anymore, but like, that's just part of the, that's part of the, the journey, I think. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. That's amazing. Um, my, no, the, the question, the last question goes, just a proud moment for you in this journey. Yeah. I, okay. So for me, it's all about the team and the culture that we built here. Um, you know, you hear all of these crazy stories about startups and toxic cultures and things like that. And so I mean, the, the proudest moments I would say are not about, um, are not about like a, a specific business success, a specific deal that we've done. It's things like when the pandemic hit uh, and we lost almost all of our enterprise business and it looked like, you know, if we can't figure this out, it could be lights out like it has been for a lot of businesses. Um, and the team just said, you know what, we're going to get through this. Um, we, we had a big two hour meeting. We talked through, we were really transparent with the team. We said, you know, this is a situation. This is a financial situation. This is what's happened to our pipeline. We think that we can save the business by doing this transition to direct consumer. We have no idea how to do that, but we're all going to work together and we're going to get it done. And every single person on the team was like, we're going to get it done. And uh, through the back half of March into late April, early May, everyone worked seven days a week. No one complained. No one asked for more money or time off or anything. Everyone just said like, we're going to get this done. We're going to make it work. 
uh, and we did. And so that is, is easily just seeing the team work like that uh, is the thing that I'm the most proud of. Greg, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out branchfurniture.com and uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.